Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today. I'm Jeffrey Lewis. I'm the director of the Nuclear Strategy and Nonproliferation Initiative at the New America Foundation. Uh, today we have James Acton, who is a lecturer at King's College London. Uh, I, I have a handy bio uh, that my uh, that one of our, our uh, staff members just gave me, but I, I know James uh, quite well. Uh, and what his bio uh, doesn't say, but I is worth mentioning, is uh, how exquisitely qualified he is uh, to give the talk that he's going to give today. Uh, James was trained as a physicist, and so he has considerable technical expertise. Um, but he also is at the center of a variety of important uh, initiatives and debates uh, taking place right now on arms control and disarmament. Uh, James is also a consultant to the Norwegian government. Uh, and I think in that capacity, he has been involved in the UK-Norwegian dialogue on technical measures to verify disarmament. Something's awfully funny in there. Um, and he is also the co-author with uh, George Perkovich of the forthcoming Adelphi paper uh, on disarmament. Uh, and so there are a few people right now who are more in the thick of things than, than James. Uh, James is also a blogger. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, James blogs on uh, my blog, armscontrolwonk.com. And his talk today is about a theme that we've had uh, back and forth a little bit on the blog, but a lot in conversation. And I think it's a, it's a terribly important topic. Uh, in Washington, the debate over the IAEA and the performance of Mohamed Alberde as a director general is a sort of intensely partisan exercise uh, that is essentially a function of debates about the Iraq War in 2003. If you're against the war, you're for Alberde because he was against it. And if you're for the war, you're against Alberde because he was against it. Uh, and I think that, that that sort of a partisan debate obscures us to more important long-term questions about what the role of the IAEA and the Director General is uh, in nonproliferation matters. Uh, long after uh, we have uh, settled or forgotten or moved on from the debates of 2003, we will have to worry about nuclear proliferation and we will have to answer tough questions about what it is we expect the IAEA to do. Uh, and the reason this is so important is because open source information, and particularly the information the IAEA collects, has become really central to our intelligence capabilities. Uh, if you look at the recent 721 reports that the Director of Nation National Intelligence releases on proliferation, you'll note that the Iran section is very heavily based uh, on the results of IAEA inspections at Natanz. And if you look at the most recent NIE, the unclassified, cover letter, uh, a document which draws conclusions about Iran's intentions uh, and their motivations, that document is also based uh, significantly in part on the results of IAEA inspections. And so we're in, in a very interesting period in time where the IAEA is playing a very central role in collecting technical information, and that technical information is being used to form judgments about the intentions of other states. And I, I think it is becoming it is very tempting uh, and maybe almost unavoidable for the IAEA to be drawn into that debate uh, about how to interpret the technical information it collects. Um, I think reasonable people can disagree about this, and, and I, I think it's probably a nonpartisan issue. I myself am not exactly sure where at this point to draw those lines and how to draw them. Uh, and so that is why I'm gratified to have James Acton here today uh, to at least start that discussion. Thanks for that kind introduction, Jeffrey. Um, it's, a great, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, let me start by confessing that, actually, as Jeffrey hinted, the title is something of a lie. Um, when you put Iran in the title of a talk, you tend to get a bigger audience. But the main, the main purpose of this presentation, and to be fair, I will be talking about Iran for a good two-thirds of this, is, not, is to use Iran as an example to ask broader questions about verification and compliance with arms control agreements. And in particular, to look at the issue of the role of intent. Why states say they have violated an agreement? And intuitively, this would seem to me, at least, to be an important aspect of verifying arms control treaties. It's something that we're all familiar from, from the domestic legal process. Certainly under British law, and I assume there's the exact analogy under US law, the difference between murder and manslaughter is one of intentions. Somebody who accidentally murders somebody is not guilty of murder, they are guilty of manslaughter. And similarly, debates about intentions, why a state has done what it's done, 
come up in international politics and in the Security Council. So this here, here are just to set the scene a couple of quotations from July 2006, and this is from the first of the UN Security Council resolutions, at least the first ones, the first meaningful one over Iran. And um, there was one no vote on that occasion against the resolution, and that came from the ambassador, well, that came from uh, Qatar. And the ambassador said, we would have seen no harm in waiting a few days so as to exhaust all possible ways and means in order to determine Iran's real intentions. Qatar clearly questioning whether or not uh, Iran's real intentions were the manufacture of nuclear weapons or whether they violated their safeguards agreement for another reason. And the British ambassador on that occasion did not question the terms of the debate. He didn't disagree that this was a debate about intentions. His argument was that Iran's intentions had clearly been shown to be malign. And thus he said, we have given Iran many opportunities to show that it has no intention to develop nuclear weapons. Regrettably, Iran has not taken the steps required by the IAEA board and the Security Council that would help build confidence. So what I'd like to do for the next 45 minutes before opening up for questions is to look at the role of intention in verifying and enforcing arms control agreements. So I've talked a bit about what states say about intent, the importance that Iran's intentions have played in this debate. And then I want to go and look at what the MPT has to say about intention, what role intention has to play in the, in, in the MPT. Then I want to go on to look for the bulk of the talk about how the IAEA goes about assessing intent and about how good or bad that process is. And finally get to the, I think, the most important part of the talk, which is to take a step back from Iran, to use the lessons from Iran to ask some broader questions about arms control and about treaty enforcement and verification. So Article 2 of the MPT is really the place to start. And this is the injunction upon all non-nuclear weapon states not to manufacture or otherwise acquire nuclear weapons or other explosive devices and not to seek or receive any assistance in the manufacture of nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. And while the treaty was being negotiated, there was a debate about what manufacture means. Where along the chain of events in the creation of a nuclear weapon is one said to have been manufactured? If you assemble all of the different parts for a nuclear weapon but keep them separately and you don't put them together, have you manufactured it? Does it come at the point where you design, where, you, where your leader has the first inkling of a thought about building one? And this was a very contentious issue during the negotiation for the MPT. And so agreement was sought by the United States around what's called a purpose criteria. And that purpose criteria, which I think rather than explaining what one is, I should just show, show, show it in this case. According to the negotiating history, and this is the undisputed interpretation to date, defines what we mean by manufacturing a nuclear weapon within the meaning of the treaty. And it is this. Facts indicating that the purpose of a particular activity was the acquisition of a nuclear explosive device would tend to show non-compliance. And in fact, it's just that first line plus one word that's the important part. Facts indicating that the purpose of a particular activity was the acquisition of a nuclear explosive device would tend to show non-compliance. Why? under the meaning of the MPT, why you're doing something affects its legality. If you are enriching uranium with the intention for the purpose of building a nuclear weapon further down the line, then you are in violation of Article 2 of the MPT. If you are making hemispheres out of uranium, with the intention of building a nuclear weapon, then you are in violation of the MPT. 
if you're building these hemispheres of the uranium with the intention of using them for paperweights, then you are not in violation of the MPT. So just as an aside at this point, let me just put up the beginning of the National Intelligence Estimate uh, from, from last year. Uh, and this is, the, uh, this is Iran's centrifuge facility at Natanz, um, just for kind of a bit of illustration. I point out that based on the legal interpretation, the legal understanding of Article 2 of the MPT, that actually even the, the, um, the NIE is somewhat misleading and at least somewhat confusing. Because it says, we judge with high confidence that in fall 2003, Tehran halted its nuclear weapons program. And if we look at the way that nuclear weapons program is defined, the NIE says it, we mean Iran's nuclear weapon design and weaponization work and its other covert activities. We do not mean Iran's declared civil work related to enrichment and conversion. But under the meaning of the treaty, if Iran's declared civil work related to enrichment and conversion is done with the intention of building nuclear weapons further down the line, then Iran is manufacturing nuclear weapons. And so the meaning, um, the, the meaning assigned, to the, um, assigned to the term nuclear weapons program in the NIE is something of a confusing one, in my opinion. And that it actually would have been much better if the NIE defined it more broadly. Now, if the NIE reaches the conclusion that Iran is not enriching uranium for a weapons program, then Iran is not in violation of the MPT. But this particular definition of the term nuclear weapons program is, is one that's inconsistent, at least, with the standard meaning of the terms under international law. But that's just kind of an aside, just a, a, a dig at the crafters of the M NIE, which is almost mandatory when giving a talk on Iran these days. Much... What I just hope to have established so far that then is that within the meaning of the MPT and Article 2, intentions matter. And unsurprisingly, the world has looked to the IAEA to answer this issue about Iran's intention and to tell us why Iran has done what it's done. Here are just a couple of quotes just, just to demonstrate this point from recent days. Uh, Erna, which is the Iranian news agency, said on the 23rd of February, and that was one day after the um, most recent IEA report on Iran came out, that the report of the IEA of 22nd of February is unambiguously attesting to the exclusively peaceful nature of the ar nuclear program of the Islamic Republic of Iran, both in the present and in the past. So, the Iranian government, as of course it does on every occasion, says that its actions and its intentions, crucially, have been vindicated by the IAEA. But it's not just the Iranian news agency that's saying this. Uh, in fact, the Associated Press came to an almost identical conclusion to the Iranians. And the Associated Press conclusion, its summary of what happened, again, very strongly relies on what it believes the agency has said about Iranian intentions. It says, Tehran has cooperated in other areas of an IAEA probe, leading the agency to put to rest for now suspicions that several past experiments and activities were linked to a weapons program, said an agency report. So Associated Press clearly believes that the most recent IAEA report has reached the conclusion that what Iran did in the past, its suspicious activities, in fact, weren't suspicious. They weren't linked to a nuclear weapons program. Iran's intentions of its past actions, according to the AP, are benign. So now let me, let's kind of zoom in onto the agency itself. And let's look at what the agency believes its role is and how the agency goes about fulfilling that role. And the first surprise is if you, is it is not the IAEA's job to assess intent. And the IAEA does not believe it's its job to assess intent. If you speak to IAEA officials and you say, is it your organization's job to assess 
why Iran carried out certain past actions, they will say no. Our role is limited to working out what Iran has done, not why Iran has done that. And I want to explore this for a bit longer because this is crucial to understanding what role the IEA could conceivably play. The first reason why the IEA does not assess intent is because it is not legally allowed to do so. I won't go into the long legal discussion, but legally the IEA was set up to work out what states have done, not why they have done it. But actually, laws can be changed. It's much harder to change physics, as it were. Well, it's pretty much impossible to change physics. But So what I'd like to talk a bit about, to start here, is how you would go about incessing intent if you wanted to, and then why that is going to be an incredibly hard thing for the agency to do. It seems to me there's two ways you can prove what a state's intentions are. And proof is, in my opinion, an unreasonable burden to place. I think proof is an unreasonable thing to look for. But it's what states are demanding from the IEA. So let's talk about proof for a bit. There are some objects and activities that are unambiguously associated with the manufacture of nuclear weapons. And these are very few and far between. If you caught a state physically manufacturing uranium or plutonium hemispheres, there is no known use for those devices other than the production of nuclear weapons. And so that would be proof beyond any reasonable doubt about what the state's intentions were. But such objects are small and they are easily hidden, and they are easily moved and easily concealed. And so even if a state is manufacturing these unambiguous objects or conducting other unambiguous activities, the chances of the IEA discovering them are pretty remote. Indeed, the IEA discovered that Iran has in its possession documents describing how to make uranium hemispheres but those were deemed not to be unambiguous proof of Iran's intentions. Iran claimed that it wasn't going to manufacture these spheres. It was given the document as a gift by A.Q. Khan, um, who's never done anything for free in his life. So, but, but, <laughs> but this was apparently enough of a, um, of a justification for Iran's actions, that it had, uh, uh, it, it had this document in its possession, and it wasn't going to manufacture these spheres. So even discovering a document describing how to manufacture these objects isn't enough. You actually need to describe the objects themselves. The second thing the agency could do to discover why Iran, to prove Iran's intentions from its past actions, is what I would term nuclear mind reading. And that is knowing why an activity was conducted. Iran got caught manufacturing a material called polonium-10, but polonium-210, that apart from a handful of uses um, such as anti-static devices, has made the headlines A, as a way to assassinate Russian dissidents in the UK, and B, as uh, uh, triggers for nuclear weapons, as the initiator for a nuclear weapon. And if we could somehow know why this um, activity, the production of polonium-210, was authorised, then we could know whether or not Iran had violated Article 2 of the MPT. If we could somehow look into the mind of the person who authorised it and know whether or not this person authorised it to build nuclear weapons or to manufacture radioisotopic batteries, which is Iran's claimed reason for manufacturing it, then we could know uh, whether or not what Iran's intentions were. And this is something that national intelligence agencies try to do. If you intercept signals intelligence of a phone call between two senior leaders discussing what they've done, that is a way of nuclear mind reading. Um, if you've got human intelligence right at the core of the program and somebody who was there or even authorised it themselves 
tells you why they did it. That's a way of doing nuclear mind reading. But the agency doesn't do human intelligence or signals intelligence, and frankly, quite right too. I mean, if the agency got into the business of spying on states in the same way that all of our national intelligence agencies do, I think it would find itself even more unpopular than it is awfully quickly. So the agency, again, can't do nuclear mind reading. It's allowed to conduct interviews with the permission of the host state, but conducting interviews with Iranian officials in the room are hardly going to be enough to, to, to really whittle down why actions and activities were conducted. So all the agency really has at its disposals, if it wants to try and assess intent, is to really do what national intelligence agencies do the whole time. And that is to look for correlations between ambiguous indicators. That is, to look at what evidence it has from in its inspections, to look at the information the state is obliged to tell the agency, to look at leaders' statements on TV, to look at... Um, <coughs> analysis of the threats, the drivers of proliferation, and to combine all of that together in a very um, tricky to perform error prone analysis and come out with some kind of conclusion. And in theory, the IEA could do that. In theory, the IEA could try and assess states intentions in this murky, difficult way. But you're never going to get proof out of that. And the agency feels under incredible pressure to produce proof. Not just evidence of intentions, but proof of intentions. And it's worth bearing in mind that even if you were to legally task the agency with going down that route, which is not at the moment, it could never provide proof of intentions. It would at most be evidence in the same kind of language that the NIE with its estimates of low confidence, median confidence, and high confidence are phrased. So it's not the IAEA's intent job legally to assess intent. And the IEA doesn't think it's its job. And it would be an extremely hard thing to do, even if you wanted it to be its job. So this raises a key question. What does the IAEA mean? when it says um, that it has closed the file on an issue, that it regards an issue as being no longer outstanding. Because that's happened an awful lot over the past few months. The IEA's reports have said repeatedly that this issue and that issue and another issue have now been closed and are, and are, no, longer being regard and are no longer regarded as outstanding. So let's have a look at what I've somewhat unkindly called the Delphic utterances from the Viennese oracle uh, in, 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 um, in, in, in the agency statements about Iran. Now, I apologize that this is a fairly long slide. But if we're going to really delve down into what the agency means, we need to kind of look in detail about the agency's conclusions on Iran. And I've already introduced Polonium-210, which was this material that Iran has manufactured. And there was lots of questions relating to how much polonium-210 Iran produced, what it did with this polonium-210, and most importantly, why it produced it. So the agency in paragraph 21 of the most recent report faithfully reports what Iran has been saying about its actions. According to Iran, the polonium-210 was not aimed at a specific immediate application. However, a potential use in radioisotope batteries, if the chemical extraction of polonium-210 proved successful, was mentioned in the initial declaration. In other words, Iran's justification is that this was fundamental scientific research that could have had applications in the production of radioisotope batteries if it had been successful. Again, Iran reiterates the project was not part of any larger R&D project clearly meaning it wasn't part of a nuclear weapons program. And now let's look at the conclusion. Based on an examination of all of the information provided by Iran, the agency concluded that the explanations concerning the content and magnitude of polonium-210 extracted 
were consistent with the agency's findings and with other information available to it. The agency considers this question no longer outstanding. All of the IAEA is saying is it knows how much polonium-210 Iran has produced. Actually, it's not even saying that much. It's saying it has a self-consistent picture of how much polonium-210 Iran has produced. It is not saying anything about the truth or falsity of paragraphs 21 and 22. That is Iran's claims as to why it has done what it's done. The agency reports those claims faithfully. It tells the world Iran's explanations for why it produced polonium-210, but makes no claim whatsoever about whether or not they are true. So in answer to my question, what does the IAEA mean when it says it has closed the file on an issue? It means nothing more, and this is still a big achievement incidentally, but it means that it has achieved a self-consistent picture of what Iran did. It is making no claim whatsoever about whether those past actions were part of a nuclear weapons program. But unfortunately, this is something that is misunderstood by the media and by diplomats. Two analysts who may be known to very many of you in this room, uh, Ray Takei and Joe Cirincione, writing in the Financial Times on the 27th of February said, it, referring to the agency, is also satisfied that experiments with polonium-210 that can be used as a trigger for an explosive nuclear chain reaction were not part of a larger weapons project. In fact, the agency, as we've discussed, didn't say that at all. It said it was satisfied it knew how much polonium has been produced. It made no claim whatsoever about why the polonium was produced. And it's kind of worrying that two analysts who are as well respected and good at what they do as Takei and Cirincioni would make a mistake like this. Like if they're making this kind of mistake, then an awful lot of other people out there are. As, for instance, the ambassador from South Africa did during the recent discussions about, um, um, in the Security Council about the most recent UN resolution. Here is what Mr. Kamalo said. He said, those issues that originally gave rise to serious concerns resulting in the demands for confidence building measures, including suspending the uranium enrichment program, have now also been clarified. The situation has further changed following the release of the United States National Intelligence Estimate, which concluded that Iran does not have a current nuclear weapons program. The NIE seems consistent with the IEA's findings to date. It really depends on what he means by consistent with. I mean, me holding this um, uh, remote control here is consistent with the moon orbiting the Earth every 28 days. But it in no way provides evidence or proof that the moon is orbiting the Earth every 28 days. Similarly, the agency's results really say nothing about the conclusion of the NIE that Iran didn't have a nuclear weapons program. Neither positive nor negative. They are talking about something different. They are talking about what Iran did. The NIE was talking about why Iran was doing it. So what I hope I've demonstrated to you so far is really that we have a problem. That there is a very, very widespread assumption out there that the IEA assesses intent. It doesn't, and realistically I don't think it could in the short term at least without much, much bigger changes. So what I'd now like to do is take a step back. and discuss some of the broader questions that this raises. My concern here is not so much about how to solve the Iranian crisis. It is a concern and it's a big one, but there's going to be proliferators beyond Iran. And the big issue it seems to me is how we use this lessons, how we use the confusion over intention and improve the situation 
so that we are living in a world with a rules-based system of non-proliferation that works, that prevents states that are seeking to acquire nuclear weapons from doing so. So I'd like to conceptualize a bit first how verification doesn't work. If you read the treaties and quite a lot of the commentary on the treaties, the view, the image of how the verification and compliance procedure works looks like this. There's a state out there that's in non-compliance. And the IEA comes along and detects that non-compliance using its verification system. And the international community is so outraged by the fact that a state has violated its safeguards agreement that it uh, produces, that it agrees upon enforcement actions. And those enforcement actions promptly bring the state back into compliance. Let me try and give you a slightly more realistic model. And I don't claim this is realistic, I claim this is slightly more realistic model of how this part of the process works. Just the first two boxes. <laughs> Somewhere out there we have non-compliance. Does this have the laser pointer on? That would help. Oh. Right. Somewhere out there we have non-compliance. And that non-compliance might be detected by verification. It might not be detected. And the immediate result of verification is international debate. The countries start talking about what to do about the non-compliance. And two factors come into this international debate that I haven't really, that um, one of which I've focused a lot on, which is the motives of the violator. Why did Iran violate its safeguards agreement? Countries want to know. They're not happy in authorizing enforcement merely because Iran has violated its safeguards agreement, they want to know why. And in addition to that, they start questioning the quality of the evidence produced by the IAEA. They say, you haven't given us proof. You've just given us evidence. We need, we need proof that Iran has done what you've claimed it has done. The crucial thing to understand, of course, and this is so obvious, but it also bears repeating, is states interpret the evidence based on what they want the answer to be. Russia and China support Iran because they're strong trading partners, not because they really disbelieve the evidence provided by the IEA, but because they want to back up Iran because they value their bilateral relations. Similarly, the US um, attacks Iran because it has a bad bilateral relation with Iran. So, when you have non-compliance, you also get a whole load of lobbying around the back, which is designed to make states' political and economic considerations change. If you support us on Iran, then we will give you this trade deal, or we will do X, Y, and Z to you. So to make it in states' economic or political considerations to interpret the evidence in a different way. Anyway, the result of that debate is normally more verification, and the IEA goes back and does more and more verification. And then, of course, you have another aspect of the international debate that I haven't spoken about, which is what the best solution is. And finally, you might get enforcement actions. And I haven't even discussed whether those enforcement actions will work. All I'm thinking about here is the process of authorizing those enforcement actions in the first place. And it seems to me that... Um, We have a problem. States, oh, states care about what Iran's, any states, any violators' motivations are, and yet we have no efficient way of assessing what those motives are. It's not the IAEA's job. If I was a state that was out there developing nuclear weapons at the moment, I would take away from all of this that if I ever get caught by the IAEA, what I should do is I should play the motives card. The best way of avoiding punishment, of avoiding sanctions, will be to say, I'm not, I didn't violate my safeguards agreement, I didn't, um, I didn't break the rules because I'm building a nuclear weapon, 
I, built, I broke the rules because I was worried that if I declared my enrichment program, then I would get bombed by some other state out there. That if the state that's caught violating its agreements uses this motives card and claims that its motives are benign, it can stall the entire already slow, arduous and complicated process of enforcing the agreement and of applying the sanctions for a state that have been found in non-compliance. And so it seems to me that looking beyond the Iranian crisis, we have set a very, very dangerous precedent. That the extent to which the debate over Iran has revolved around Iran's motives without any means of assessing what those motives are, have sent a signal out to future proliferators that here is a very good way of slowing the response of the international community. So now let me give you some observations about how we might start digging ourselves out of this hole. And for this purpose, I really want to divide international enforcement into two different strands. And this division is not perfect. You can't make the separation cleanly, but there is some value to it, I would argue. Firstly, there is what I would call the international organizations strand. The international organizations that are charged with enforcing the MPT and the Safeguards Agreement, namely the IEA Board of Governors and the UN Security Council. And secondly, there is the state-to-state -state strand, the bilateral or trilateral or quadrilateral negotiations between the IAEA and the state, uh, sorry, but, but, between, the group, uh, but, between one group of negotiating states and the violating state. So for instance, uh, the E3, the European 3, uh, and their negotiations with Iran is an example of this state-to-state -state strand. The E3 plus 3, or the P5 plus 1, I should say, because that's what it's always called in the, in, in, in the States, uh, is another example. US-Iranian bilateral negotiations, if they ever happen, would be another example of this state-to-state -state strand. And what I think is that in the international strand, the Board of Governors and the UN Security Council, we need to try, as far as is possible, to take intentions out of the enforcement process. A state should be penalised on what it has done, not on why it did it. A degree of proportion proportionality is crucial in this. The more serious a state's violations are, the more serious the sanctions and punishments deserve to be. I mean, I'm not advocating um, military action and the regime change in the, in the event you forget to fax your uh, declaration to the IEA on time. What I am arguing is that if a state has committed serious violations, it should be punished irrespective of why those violations happened. And this is really born out of two beliefs. <coughs> Firstly, the fact that we can't assess intentions. There is no organization to reliably assess intentions. And that's a real problem if you're making decisions based on intentions in the Board of Governors or the Security Council. But secondly, because of the deterrent effect, the message it sends out, that any state that violates its agreement <coughs> will not be able to use the motives card, will not be able to escape punishment and confuse the situation by arguing that it's OK, I broke the rules for good reasons rather than bad reasons. On the state-to-state -state strand, on the way that the United States or the European Three deals with Iran, intentions are crucial. We're not going to be able to solve the Iranian crisis unless we understand what drove Iran to acquire nuclear weapons, and we take appropriate actions, like security assurances, for instance, to reassure Iran on, the, on that front. But my argument is that that is, that is what happens when states talk to each other behind the scenes, quietly and privately. It's not something that should be aired publicly in the Board of Governors and the Security Council. 
but there, their job is the organization is to punish and to deter by means of punishment future violations. And you need to take intent out of that process as far as possible. So let me just summarize that policy conclusion before showing what I mean, how you implement a policy like this in practical terms. My argument is that international sanctions, whether enacted through the Board of Governors or the Security Council, should be based on what a non-compliant state has done, not why it acted. But in these bilateral negotiations, of course you take intent into account. Now this is not I hope, I think, an arbitrary, uh, uh, a, a pie-in-the-sky wish of how enforcement ought to work. Let me give you three practical steps that states can take to start bringing this process about. And it's going to be a long thing. It's not some bit of change you can make overnight. These are recommendations related to the way that we as an international community enforce arms control agreements in lots of different forums on lots of different occasions. The first one is very simple. If you want to take intent out of the debate, stop talking about it. This is something which the United States and the United Kingdom and France and Germany have been guilty of and frankly it has come back to bite them. If we had stopped talking about intent so much in the Board of Governors and the IAEA, it would have been much harder for China and Russia, for instance, to jump on the intent bandwagon. If our argument had been Iran should have sanctions enacted on it because it's violated its safeguards agreement, the argument would have been a much stronger one over the long run than Iran should have sanctions on it because it's building, building nuclear weapons. Incidentally, this could also help negotiations between the E3 plus 3 and Iran. If you're not publicly accusing your adversary of building nuclear weapons, if you're toning down the dialogue a bit, it does help you talk to them and negotiate with them in private. Second, apply the rules equally. There can be no exemptions for US friends and allies who break the rules. And the example I'm thinking of here is South Korea. South Korea has violated its safeguards agreement. It conducted undeclared reprocessing experiments that were, in both the letter and the spirit, contrary to the, its safeguards agreement with the IAEA. And indeed, when this was discovered, when it came out, the UK drafted a, declara a, a, a motion of non-compliance, which the US and other states opposed and eventually got... Um, kind of um, got the UK to abandon the whole scheme because US is friendly with South Korea and US values South Korean relations very, very highly. This was an error. South Korea was in non-compliance with its safeguards agreement and it should have been found in non-compliance with its safeguards agreement and it should have been punished appropriately, which would have been much, much less severe than the sanctions placed on Iran because Iran's violations were objectively much more serious than South Korea's violations. But had the US punished South Korea, and had, or rather had the US allowed South Korea to be punished, it would have massively strengthened the US's case that Iran too ought to have been punished, and that the US is not punishing Iran because it's its enemy, it's punishing Iran because it broke the rules. And my third suggestion, is uh, the former Director General, Deputy Director General at the IAEA, Pierre Goldschmidt, has come up with a scheme whereby the UN Security Council passes a resolution that says, if a state is found in non-compliance, the following steps will automatically ensue. It's a form of automatic enforcement. These are not, we're not talking here about things here like military action. We're talking about, um, greater safeguards so that, so that the state can't um, use its violation to help further a weapons program. I mean, this is kind of all very 
straightforward, sensible stuff that would help stop states using the benefits of a violation to uh, develop nuclear weapons. And Pierre's proposals are very uh, contentious, but this idea of automatic enforcement, that if you break the rules and you're found in non-compliance, then any state, whoever you are, is treated equally and is sanctioned or punished according to the letter of the law, would again seem to me to be uh, to tie in very nicely with this idea that states ought to be punished not on why they have acted, but on what they have done. So with that, let me thank you very much for your attention and say that I'm very, very happy to take questions and have a bit of a discussion now. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, why not? All right. Well, then I'm going to part of this. Sorry, that Jeffrey. We don't get blinded. <laughs> oh, is that going to work? High technology here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, since we have uh, a relatively crowded room, uh, I think what we're going to end up doing is taking questions in groups. Uh, but I wanted, I wanted to ask the first one, because I don't disagree with the practical steps that you outlined. Um, but I do, I do have a conceptual issue mm -hmm. here, which is if Iran were to return to compliance, uh, sort of the, the status quo ante, uh, and were to continue building centrifuges, and, and were to continue to uh, uh, not adhere to the additional protocol, I mean, that doesn't solve our problem at some fundamental level. And so, so although I'm, I'm sympathetic to taking a rules-based approach to things, I mean, we do have a fundamental problem, which is we are suspicious about their intentions. And, and, and so what we, what we hope for, or at least what, what I hope for, is extraordinary level of intrusive inspections above and beyond what might be the norm for NPT states. And so, I mean, can you, under the, the proposals you outlined, preserve a diplomacy uh, that gets us to someplace better than you know, 54,000 centrifuges and no additional protocol? I think the answer to that one is yes. I, th I think in the case of Iran, I'm a great believer that when the Security Council has passed a resolution, if you want to live in a rules-based system of non-proliferation, I mean, if you want to live in a rules-based system of international law, let alone non-proliferation, Security Council resolutions passed for better or for ill have to be respected. But Iran can comply with the Security Council resolutions that exist at the moment in a different number of ways. I mean, the Security Council could permit Iran to recommence pilot scale enrichment very quickly, or it could permit Iran, or it could not permit Iran to, to recommence pilot scale enrichment very slowly for a prolonged period of time. So, in answer to the question of can you fit diplomacy in? with a more automatic system? The answer would be yes. In, so, in terms of, in these bilateral negotiations, the P5 plus 1 could promise Iran that if it takes these steps and complies with UN Security Council resolutions, then those resolutions will be rescinded after a fairly short period of time. That if it, if it pauses its enrichment program, it allows the IAA to draw a broader declaration under the additional protocol, that is to certify that there are no undeclared centrifuges in Iran, uh, um, no, no undeclared nuclear activity in Iran, then um, as soon as that's done, the uh, Security Council will permit Iran to restart its enrichment on a pilot scale. That said, I'm not sure I would want to go down that line. Having said you can do that, I'm increasingly of the opinion that a state that has violated its safeguards agreement should be prohibited from enrichment or reprocessing technology for some period of time. Uh, and I think there are pros and cons with um, having a fixed period of time or allowing the Security Council to decide when. Um, but um, it's not an issue. I mean, I don't know the answer to that one yet. But the answer is yes, I think you can preserve flexibility. Would this, I promise, is my last follow-up, but would, uh, would the non-compliance by the Korea Atomic Energy <coughs> Research Institute have triggered your uh, suspension for some period of time from each, enrichment? Each should have done, yes. Okay. Great. So we're going to take a variety of questions. Uh, <coughs>
we have people with uh, microphones who should be standing in the back to bring you the microphones. We don't. Okay, why don't you come up and take one of the microphones? <laughs> James and I will share. Uh, and uh, let's start with uh, Gareth Porter. Gareth, raise your hand, sir. Thanks very much. Um, if, if I understood what you were saying about the IAEA, IAEA um, it, its position in the latest report on uh, Iran's uh, uh, record with regard to PO210, you were saying that, uh, that the IAEA um, did not make any claim about the falsity, truth of its statement at all except for the amount of the polonium produced. I, I didn't see that in the, in the statement that you had up there. Uh, it, it said, and I quote, that the information provided by Iran, uh, by Iran is consistent with other information available to IAEA, IAEA. That, of course, refers to all the intelligence that is provided by the United States and other uh, opponents of Iran. Um, it's not clear to me, I, certainly I don't see that that is a statement that is not making more of a claim than we are confident about the, well, th that makes some statement about the amount of polonium. It's, it's a broader statement, isn't it? I, I'm just trying to understand exactly what the situation is in your view. We're going to take a series of questions, so I saw a few other hands. Uh, there's one in the back. <coughs> Uh, Simon Henderson, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, you were giving a legal treatise, and I thought you were becoming excitingly um, close to uh, politics before you veered back into legalese, um, which I think was a bit of a cop-out. Um, since you introduced the example of South Korea, it's easy enough to imagine circumstances whereby in uh, quiet diplomatic negotiations, the United States would say to South Korea, you really, it's very naughty of you to do these experiments, but uh, frankly, if you've got security concerns, um, forget it, because Uncle Sam has looked after you for the past 50 years and uh, currently uh, will continue to look after you. Um, in the case of Iran, um, you said uh, diplomacy would try to address Iran's security concerns. Um, could you sort of describe what sort of measures the United States or indeed the broader world community could come up with which would address Iran's security concerns? Uh, because it suggests that um, Iran's apparent pursuit of nuclear weapons uh, is a tradable option in, in Tehran's terms. And uh, I, for one, am not convinced. Thank you. And we'll take uh, one more right here in the uh, very nice Dan suit. <laughs> Daniel Robinson, National Iranian American Council. Um, I actually ha I'm actually looking for some clarification because I have before me uh, the information circular that Iran uh, issued right after the IAEA board submitted a support. And inside the circular itself, Iran has stated that it suspended enrichment for a period of two and a half years, as well as that even though it did not follow strict adherence of the additional protocols, it did follow the legal provisions of similar protocols that are found in the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement. I was wondering if you can explain the distinctions between those two documents, as well as also give us some idea as to how we can move beyond suspension as a precondition of talks about this issue. Because again, as the gentleman from when I stated, that Iran does look at the pursuit of nuclear weapons as a very tradable issue. I think it's more to the point that the attempted pursuit of nuclear weapons, at least in terms of a potential breakout capability later on, in regards to its own security threats, security concerns uh, in the area, poses a slightly more, uh, slightly more uh, relevant challenge than the actual pursuit of the weapons themselves. I, I think that's, do you want to? 
So in answer about the polonium-210 question, let me just repeat again, I will read it out. Based on an examination of all information provided by Iran, the agency concluded that the explanations concerning the content and magnitude of the polonium-210 experiments were consistent with the agency's findings and with other information available to it. The only thing that the agency is saying here is that it knows when it compares the information provided by Iran to external information. And actually, in this case, it's almost certainly not intelligence. It's almost certainly what inspectors on the grounds are finding inspectors on the grounds have measured. Uh, it, it, it almost certainly in this case results from its own inspections. Um, it's saying that these two are consistent um, with, with explanations concerning the content and magnitude of the polonium-210. So yes, all this report is saying is that it's about what Iran has done, not why Iran has done that. And this is not, I mean, I should say, this is not me kind of reading more into the agency um, than it means. I mean, this is also based on my discussions with agency officials and asking them to interpret their own findings. And this is very much what they say these findings mean. Uh, just, just to follow up, is there a, I mean, do you believe that there is a legitimate intent issue here? That is to say that intelligence agencies do have information suggesting an intent that should have been reflected? I have, no, I have no idea whether intelligence agencies have that well, James, information. Uh, let me ask a follow on that because yep. I mean, one issue is potentially the the scale, right, of the activity. And that may not be true for polonium two ten, but at least for other things, I mean, the technical details may matter to inferring intent. But but what you're saying is the agency stops short of that last step. Yes. So now that you had two excellent questions about. Uh, Simon Henderson wondered about whether or not you were prejudicing the possibility for quiet diplomatic negotiations uh, and, and, and what you would hope to achieve in negotiations with Iran. It's a, it's a very good question. I'm not, I mean I don't consider myself an expert on Iranian domestic politics. Um, I think we have to assume that Iran's nuclear weapons program is tradable. That assumption might be wrong, in which case Iran is going to get a nuclear weapon and there's nothing we can do about it. So from the point of view of, I mean, if you start from the assumption that it's not tradable, then you might just as well give up on all diplomacy now and decide whether you'd rather bomb Iran or get a nuclear weapon. Um, that just seems to be a reason for giving up on diplomacy. Given that we don't know whether or not Iran's nuclear weapons ambitions are tradable, then we might as well assume they are and negotiate with Iran and see how far we go. I think to make those negotiations successful, and this is where national intelligence agencies and their estimates of intent very much come into it, we need, I think, a much better picture, certainly, than is in the public domain at the moment, about why Iran wants a nuclear weapon. I mean, there's a number of different reasons. It might want it for security, it might want it for prestige, uh, internationally, it might want it for domestic prestige. Um, there's lots of possible reasons, and presumably there is more than just one reason. Presumably, <coughs> as with most nuclear weapons programs, there are a number of different drivers. And it seems to me, I mean, if your question is asking, can the US give a country that has been an enemy for so long a reliable security guarantee that Iran would believe that the US would honor? I don't know. Maybe in that case, it's not so much the US that needs to give the guarantee, but it needs to be a joint guarantee between a number of different states. I mean, I can't tell you that I can give you a solution that Iran will go and um, swallow and buy and be happy with. Um, I don't even know that there is a solution, um, but I do believe that we ought to try and find one and that national intelligence agencies' estimates of intent is central to that process. Um, in answer to the difference between the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement and the Additional Protocol, when the Non-Proliferation Treaty was constructed in 1968, it was realized intellectually that there were two ways that a state could proliferate. It could misuse declared facilities, it could divert material from declared facilities, or it could build clandestine, that is secret, facilities. 
Given the size of enrichment and reprocessing facilities as of the 1960s, it was considered almost impossible that a state would build clandestine facilities. And so the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement was designed to um, safeguard declared facilities. It gave, interestingly, it did give the legal authority to the IEA to look for secret facilities, but it didn't give it the practical tools it needed. It was a bit like telling the police they could arrest people for a crime, but without giving them the powers to investigate who might commit the crime in the first place. So the situation you had as of 1990 was the agency could reasonably effectively safeguard declared facilities, but had very little chance of detecting undeclared facilities. Then, of course, Iraq's, Iraq's massive nuclear weapons program, secret nuclear weapons program, was discovered in 1991. And there was a massive realization that the, um, that the, um, the safeguard system was inadequate. And so the purpose of the additional protocol was to give the IEA the authority it needs to detect clandestine or secret facilities. So Iran's claim that the CSA, the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, is good enough and it doesn't need to accept an additional protocol. I mean, legally it's true. Legally, no country is under a legal obligation to accept an additional protocol. But in terms of having a credible safeguard system, universalization of the additional protocol is vital. And it's I think, more or less impossible to imagine that Iran will build um, confidence in its program. I mean, accepting the additional protocol is a necessary, but probably not a sufficient step in that regard. And so what was the second part of your question? Oh, the second part was with regards to suspension and dropping that as a precondition of talks to move ahead with the issue. I, I, I'm torn on this issue. On the one hand, I believe it's pointless to sit down and have nego negotiations with preconditions. Like In principle, I absolutely think that the US should sit down with Iran and talk without preconditions. You may reach an agreement, you may not reach an agreement. I mean, I think people quite often say, assume that saying that you're willing to talk means you're willing to agree at all costs. And that's not what it means. It means you're willing to negotiate in good faith. The problem is I also believe that Security Council resolutions have to be upheld. And that is not, that's not what negotiating in good faith means. Like negotiating in good faith without preconditions means you are genuinely open to the possibility of no pause or suspension of enrichment. But my belief is that the Security Council having passed a resolution, good or bad, for better or for worse, that has to be respected. Even if it's respected for two weeks, it's got to be respected, because otherwise the very bad precedent you send out. Now, if there's some wording you can have that's a fudge, if there's some mandate for negotiations that the two sides can agree upon that makes it sound like it's preconditions, but is against the backdrop of Security Council resolutions, then that would seem to me a very worthwhile job for diplomats to hack out between them. Well, James, I. I want to follow up on that because, I mean, you say it's a job for diplomats, and it is, but there's, there's also a technical component, which is there's no technical meaning to suspension. And, and so one of the things that we've heard discussed is, what if the Iranians agreed to spin the centrifuges, which would allow them to do some work, but spin them without introducing uh, feed material, which would in some way honor the, the letter of the call for the suspension while giving them a face-saving way uh, to put some kind of constraint on the work. That's, that's, that's a possibility. I mean, deciding, leaving the ambiguity out, leaving the ambiguity, or rather allowing the ambiguities in the Security Council's wording to give you elbow room is what is, is absolutely one possibility. I mean, I guess my bigger, my objection to that kind of strategy is I don't know, I'm somebody who's very much of the belief that Iran needs to come clean about its past actions before we can move forward. And I'm very willing to facilitate a rapid return to enrichment, certainly light water reaction te technology, if Iran is willing to come clean on enrichment. What worries me is if Iran is not willing to come clean about its past actions, 
then allowing it to carry on spinning the centrifuges does lose you some of the benefits of the suspension and allows it to keep a putative nuclear weapons program up and running. So I find those two things difficult to square personally. Okay, let's take a few more questions uh, in the front and then, uh, then we'll go to the two in the back. Thank you. Mark Miyazawa. In the run-up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq, we saw two conflicting sets of information, uh, the U.S. intelligence and IAEA report. Uh, Vice President Cheney and then later President Bush uh, said, declared, there is no doubt Saddam Hussein is uh, developing nuclear weapons. On the other hand, El Barda, in his report to the UN Security Council, said the IAEA had found no evidence that Saddam Hussein has a nuclear weapons program. Uh, and at the, en the end of the day, of course, the IAEA was right and uh, the U.S. intelligence was wrong. The big uh, difference between two, uh, these two sets of information, I think, is uh, IAEA had a direct uh, contact with Iranian authorities, and U.S. Uh, intelligence depended upon information from those people, groups, outside Iraq who were opposed to Saddam Hussein. Now, uh, with regard to Iran, it appears to, to me that the very same thing is going on nowadays. U.S. says Iran has a uh, nuclear weapons program. IAEA says they have found no proof. Uh, so my question is, do you have any intention to uh, go to the U.S. administration and suggest them get in touch with Iranians directly? Yes. Um, as far as... Um, Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, Dave Ahern with uh, Space and Missile Defense Report. Um, as far as uh, 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 Ahmadinejad's uh, uh, statement that they are adding 6,000 new centrifuges to the 3,000 uh, they have now, uh, as long as they, uh, as Iran uh, continues to say that uh, uh, they're doing this strictly for uh, uh, fueling uh, peaceful nuclear mm -hmm. electrical generators, and it's not for uh, weapons. Uh, is this uh, actually uh, under uh, current regimes uh, something legal, something they're permitted to do, or uh, uh, if we go to uh, what you're suggesting, where uh, you go by what people do, not what they say is their intent, uh, would this then be outlawed? And there's uh, one back. Hi, uh, Jeremy Patterson, uh, Arms Control <coughs> Association. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, your suggestion for automatic consequences for um, violations, because um, it seems that it would be as, as you try to ratchet up pressure, um, Security Council resolutions are going to have to be involved. Um, you know, like in being able to negotiate um, these automatic consequences, they're going to have to be very small ones before resolutions get involved. So I was wondering if you could talk more, a little bit more about how, like, that, that kind of opens the door back up for politics to get back into the equation and how we might get around that problem. Great. So, three good questions. Uh, one on uh, the differences between the IAEA and Iran and, and, and the IAEA and, and really UNMOVIC in Iraq in the lead up to the Gulf War. Uh, a question about the legality of, of Iran's uh, efforts and then uh, automatic consequences. Um, <coughs> in answer to the first question about Iraq, um, I mean, yes. Uh, U.S. intelligence got it horribly wrong before Iraq. In regard to Iran, I think, I mean, what, one of the things you ended up by saying was that the IEA has announced it has no proof. No proof of what? The IEA has not said it has no proof of an Iranian nuclear weapons program. I mean, that's that, as, as I mean, as I was saying in my talk, the IEA has said nothing about Iran's intentions. 
What the IEA has proved is that Iran violated its safeguards agreement over the course of 15 or 20 years. So Iraq creates a huge problem. I mean, we went in once and turned out to be very wrong. I think the wrong reaction to that is to assume that all intelligence or findings by international agencies is wrong at all time in futures. Um, if you're going to live in a system, if you're going to live in a world in which states have nuclear weapon, uh, um, in which states are allowed to have nuclear power, and I think states probably need to have nuclear power, I mean, I don't think there's any prospect of changing that, then you have to have agreed standards of proof for action in the event of non-compliance. And that is a declaration of non-compliance by the IEA Board of Governors. Based on the information provided by the Secretariat, the IEA Board of Governors has, um, found, has, has made that finding of non-compliance. So the information in the official international forums, based on what we have of Iran, has now met the threshold for international action. And I believe the international community is justified and ought to the Security Council take action to ramp up the pressure on Iran. Um, when you say, uh, am I intending to go to the UN security, uh, to the US and urge them to speak to Iranians? I mean, I don't quite know what you mean by that. I mean, I'm not in favor of military action. Uh, I am in favor of talks, but I'm also in favor of strong diplomatic pressure. And I'll say that to anybody who asks me. Uh, in answer to the question about the centrifuges, Iran's centrifuges are currently illegal because of the Security Council resolutions. Uh, the Security Council resolutions demand that Iran um, suspends enrichment. Iran has not done so, and therefore however many centrifuges Iran has going at the moment, it is in breach of international law. Um, the more interesting question, I suppose, is then, imagine there were no Security Council resolutions. And it's a, it's a difficult question. I mean, technically, according to Article 2 of the MPT, if you are enriching for the purpose of learning how to produce HEU for a bomb, your actions are illegal. But for all of the reasons that I've explained, practically that is an impossible thing to do. Um, it is impossible for the IEA to know why a state is choosing to enrich uranium <coughs> under any reasonable circumstances. The IEA would almost never be in a position to know that. So the way it works in practice is that if a state declares all its activities and allows them to be inspected and meets the terms of its safeguards agreement, then those actions are deemed to be legal. And my system wouldn't change that at all. I mean, it wouldn't. My system would really only affect the way that the IEA works once a state has been found in non-compliance. It wouldn't really affect the way that the system worked pre-non-compliance. Um, in answer to the question at the back about <clears throat> attempting to depoliticize the Security Council, I refrain from using the word depoliticize because I'm not trying to depoliticize anything. I mean, I just don't think that's possible. Um, I have a very particular political reason for believing in this system of um, enforcement. And that is because what I'm really worried about is the next state, whoever that is sending out a strong and clear message that if you violate your safeguards agreement, you will be punished. And that's a way of stopping states from using the intent excuse. And that's kind of a specific political purpose, and I fully acknowledge that. And there's no question that it's going to be very hard to pass a generic Security Council resolution. Probably too hard. Like, I don't have very much hopes for this happening. The one thing that does give you hope, though, is that it's kind of easier to decide these things in a vacuum. When you have the five permanent members of the Security Council talking about these things in abstract terms, saying whoever the next state is, regardless of whether it's a friend or an adversary of any individual than us, we're going to treat whoever that state is in the same agreed way. It's easier to do that than once you've discovered non-compliance. It's easier, once you know who the state is, then you know who the friends and allies are, and who the adversaries are, and then battle lines start to get drawn. It's easier to agree on actions before those lines get drawn. Um, is it gonna be possible? Probably not. Like I'm, I think this is, I think Pierre Goldschmidt's idea is a great idea. My, I think the chances of it happen, happening are fairly slim at the moment.
but just to clarify, and then, then we'll take a few more questions. Uh, I thought Pierre Goldschmidt's proposal was for automatic sanctions in the event that a state that had been found in non-compliance withdrew from the NPT. Is there a second Pierre proposal that I'm missing? Uh, I think so. And maybe if it's not Pierre's proposal, then I'm it just in favor be. of the proposal. Yeah. yeah okay. um, then, then I'm just in favor of the proposal <laughs> that there ought to be automatic, uh, automatic consequences in the event of non-compliance. Uh, I thought okay. that was Pierre, but maybe uh, it wasn't. Uh, Jill, Andy, and then in front. Hi, Jill Perlow, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Actually, I, I kind of wanted to follow up on the same thing about the withdrawal clause. Article 10, it's a contentious issue, and North Korea used it to withdraw. Um, how would your system deal with that issue once a state is found in noncompliance? What do you do? I mean, do you change Article 10? States wouldn't have, most states wouldn't have joined the NPT if it hadn't been included to begin with. So I just wondered if you could talk about that. And Andy Semmel, uh, part of the problem that you dealt with today it may be that the IAEA itself doesn't have enough uh, authority to move from what you refer to as gathering e evidence to move to the level of proof that, in fact, there's the compliance or noncompliance, the case may be. Um, and um, there, there has been, obviously, there has been the evolution from the uh, comprehensive safeguards agreements I go back to the original um, uh, n n nuclear nonproliferation treaty to the additional protocol that you already discussed. It may very well be that the IA needs some additional authorities to go beyond those that they already have. Iran is a big country, for example, and even with the even if Iran were to um, uh, put in force an additional protocol, there would still be difficulties in terms of identifying uh, what might be evidence out there to lead to a, perhaps a preponderance of evidence that maybe not quite proof, but a preponderance of evidence that in fact is. Uh, might lead to suggestions about intent. I guess my question there is, have you carried your thinking, your analysis further to the point of where there might be additional authorities that the IAEA should have? There was the creation of the uh, Committee on Safeguards and Verification, which was a bust, as you, as you know. Uh, but there were about 18 recommendations that were uh, entertained by that committee at the IAEA, which didn't go anywhere. But perhaps you might want to comment on where it should go on, on, on th in this respect. James, why don't you take those two and then we'll do Kevin and okay. front, because that's a lot to chew on. Um, I mean, I haven't got any specific thinking about how to deal with the Article 10 issue. It's a huge problem. Um, the fact, I mean, it's been described as a loophole, um, which I think is misleading in one sense because it was always known to be a loophole. I mean, it was kind of always understood that there was this problem here. So I think kind of calling it a loophole disguises the fact that um, it hasn't just all of a sudden emerged. But yeah, there is a problem that a state can get all of the technology it needs to build nuclear weapons, and then with inspections and with the IEA, and then leave the treaty, and um, um, be able to use chuck out inspection inspectors and build bombs. <coughs> I think the kind of stuff that we need to be looking at is that this really is Pierre Goldschmidt's proposals now. I mean, there, Pierre has an idea, which is there are safeguards in states that, don't ha that aren't signatories to the MPT. And it gets a bit technical at this point, but there are a form of safeguards called Insert 66 safeguards. Basically, for instance, the US supplied the Israeli research reactor at Nahal Sorek or whatever it is, and as a condition of that, there are specific safeguards on that one facility. So Pierre's idea is that in the event that a state withdraws from the MPT, there would be facility-specific 66-type safeguards on all of the facilities in the country that were supplied um, by uh, external suppliers. I mean, I can't remember the exact details of his idea, but it would be a way of not allowing a state to enjoy the benefits of withdrawing from the MPT. There's other very good ideas about the states having to uh, come to before the Security Council and um, explain their actions, and give a much more convincing explanation of why they're withdrawing from the MPT, maybe allow additional inspection authority to prove they don't have a nuclear weapons program. Uh, I like all of these proposals, uh, and if I could just give a plug here for another project that I'm working on at the moment. Um, the chances of serious MPT reform in the upcoming MPT review conference are fairly slim. So I don't have much hope that this kind of stuff is going to happen next time round. But in general, I mean, one of the things that I kind of very firmly believe and have come to believe 
over, over the last couple of years, is that if the US and the UK and the other nuclear weapon states want greater progress on non-proliferation, that's going to require a greater move towards disarmament. The two are very much politically linked together. It would be a much easier world to live in if they weren't, but they are. And that if you want to see changes like Article 10 reform, you probably need to make more progress on disarmament and use that as a lever at the same time. In answer to the question about additional authority for the IEA, it's a really interesting question. In terms of should the IA, should there be an additional protocol, well, the recommendations that were put before the IEA Strengthening Safeguards Commission that did not require an expansion of the mandate. They were just recommendations that required no legal authority. And there are a lot of states that oppose greater non-proliferation measures that really don't like safeguards and succeeded in kind of stymieing the whole project. So I believe, yes, that there should be greater safeguards authority within the mandate. I would love to see a new um, legal document to, to expand the agency's mandate even further. I think there's a lot more that the agency could do to um, help detect undeclared activities. Um, and I won't go into all the technical details of that, but I think there's a lot of additional authority you could give the agency in that regard. I would be wary at this stage of giving the agency the authority to assess intent because proving intent is very hard to do. And I suspect that the agent, the internal culture of the agency at this moment in time would not allow it to use legal authority to assess intent usefully. I think it would just refrain from saying anything of interest. But this raises a more general problem, which is if we're thinking about verification, we need to think about more than just the agency. We need to think about the international community. And I think it is a huge problem that the international community demands proof. We don't demand proof, or rather we don't demand 100% proof in a court of law. We demand proof beyond reasonable doubt. In a civil court, we demand balance of probabilities. And I think there needs to be an international debate about what standard of evidence the international community requires. And I think the international community has to move away from this idea of demanding cast iron proof, because you are never going to find that, or at least you won't in 90% of the cases. And demanding proof is a way of ensuring that you're never going to enforce an arms control treaty. And so actually, I'm starting to think that the bigger problem is not so much the authority given to the agency, that that could be usefully expanded, but is the international community's <coughs> understanding and acceptance of that result, and that you could improve the verification system by improving the politics much more than the pure verification uh, authority. Okay, uh, the last two questions are Kevin and then right here in front. Mine was Article 10 related. We spent enough time on it. Okay, great. So then the last question goes over here. <laughs> Elaine Grossman with Global Security Newswire. Just uh, wondering if you might expand a bit on this sort of calibrated set of punishments that you have in mind and, and what indications there are that they would have the effects that you desire. It's a tough question. I mean, again, I'm not... What I haven't particularly talked about here is whether enforcement actions will work. Um, that is kind of a whole different talk in itself. My argument is much more based around the idea of deterring states from violating in, in the first place. I'm a great believer that the best form of non-proliferation is, is changing states' calculations so they choose not to proliferate. And so if there is a clear sense of raising the costs of proliferation, I believe it will help you deter. And that's kind of the main, um, that's kind of the main uh, thinking behind the proposal. In terms of the idea, no, I really am blinding myself. That's bright. Um, in terms of the, in terms of the, this issue about um, whether or about how the calibration would work, it's it's a big issue. I mean, obviously, with domestic courts, we have a system whereby if you commit a certain crime, you get two years in prison, and if you commit a worse crime, you get four years in prison, and there is the jurisprudence and the law that's laid down to set up this proportionality. 
I don't know that you're ever going to be able to do that system as formally in the international system. And it's always, I think, ultimately going to be a matter of negotiation between states at the time. And as soon as you get negotiation, it means that the outcome is always going to be suboptimal. But I think just kind of from a fairness point of view, treating South Korea the same way as you treat Iran is wrong, because Iran's violations were much more serious and an objective standard than South Korea. Determining exactly what kind of punishment would be suitable for South Korea um, would ultimately be a, negotiate, a matter for negotiation at the time. Okay, great. Uh, join me in thanking uh, Dr. James.